Hey, Paul. <laughs> Carrie, Carrie, I'm going to keep you on here forever. <laughs> um, <laughs> We're painting ourselves as rather tragic figures. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, it's really fun. It's really fun. Um, so I think this is a huge topic. You know, I recently watched this uh, movie, uh, The Kite Runner. I don't know, did you, did you oh, see yes. that? Oh, yes. I read the, yeah. Yeah. And uh, it, it's fascinating, that whole dynamic in Islamic culture to cover up the woman. And then, and then the question is, how suppressed is it? And then on the other side of the coin, you know, we have in like the United States, there's this weird prudishness uh, combined with this kind of excessive sexual thing. It's a real yeah. weird mixture in the United States, you know. Oh, it's, it's very interesting that because it's something that happens on your own, because you look at pornography on your own, uh, people want to pretend nobody looks at it in a way. When you might, I mean, like everyone must. <laughs> I, I thought all women did as well. And then I realized, no, they don't. <laughs> but, you know, so I, I used to look at it. And, and then what made me stop looking at it, I didn't realize how bad it was getting. I, it creeps up on you because you don't realize you're getting trained psychologically to expect hatred and total male domination. And it's actually not what you want in the slightest. And that what made me realize it was a bad idea was talking to this woman, Gail Dines, who is in, based in Boston. She's originally from Britain, and she does uh, a lot of anti-pornography protesting. And she just points out that it's, it imposes a sexual template on young boys, particularly, who've never had any experience of real, the real thing. And then uh, you can't relate to women because you think... That and, and after all, I think it's accepted that your sexuality is defined when you're young by whatever the triggers happen to be around. Not, not I mean, you're probably gay or straight from birth. I, I, pro I believe that's probably the case. But then, you know, what turns you on is defined early on, I think. Fetishes and things like that. And uh, hmm. so if they're getting violence, then you know, you're practicing this violent thing. And I think on a spiritual level as well, if you believe in the law of attraction and you're watching, you know, heinous <laughs> crimes and this, this, what wouldn't look uh, wrong on an Amnesty International website, you know, that it looks like torture, then don't expect Prince Charming to turn up because that's what you're training yourself to think of constantly. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that that's, it's interesting that some people find that exciting or enjoyable. I mean, that's, that speaks back to what you're saying earlier, just that this kind of, I don't know, moral emptiness or something. Yeah, um, and that, that they they really they do, and I think uh, the difference between it's not just a sexual thing. I'm not like totally lowering the tone. It's how a man treats you, who's a bit older compared to somebody a bit younger who's grown up with pornography um, so readily available. In the old days, I think if you looked at porn and it's just like. A, a diversion and you it was hard to get it and it was titillation and in the old days it was just a glimpse of something it wasn't so in your face and basically clinical and unsexy I think nowadays it's just it's very sterile and weird now um, then I don't think that was such a problem as it is now when you have these smartphones and you can look at it in class or anything you know and there's a definite difference between people who are older in the way they see, I feel, they're not kind of, they don't have the residual remnants of a corporate gangbang in their head <laughs> when they're talking to me. Whereas younger people, that, that's how they're going to inevitably relate to women, I think. Because but that's I do think you're, I think you're, you're, you're saying that the whole field of pornography is represented by that. that that's interesting. It seems like it's not all that. Uh, no, no, I do, yeah, I, I do think that it's, it's a great, um, what's the preoccupation of humanity, just like food and shelter. Like if you look at the internet, it's all sex and TV is all home improvement and cookery. And that's natural because we're animals and it is way, like the Kama Sutra and everything. That's all brilliant. And uh, it, there's a lot in religion, isn't there? Tantric, Tantra and all that. So that all seems fine to me and I think a lot of pornography is a great great thing but then it's the stuff that tries to pretend that we different genders are not equal and yes yeah I agree with you yeah, I agree with you it's yeah. that, it's that yeah. thing. 
is, yeah. is I think is, um, it seems like as as women try to get into it more, I think there some women are. I think, I mean, I generally I agree with you. I think it it results in an objectification of human beings, which is probably not good. <laughs> the whole the whole thing in general. But having said that, I think there are women who are maybe trying to change some of the dynamics in terms yeah. of representing a more uh, the, the nurturing, the loving, the, the yeah, beautiful yeah. aspects of intimacy. You know? Yeah, it's, it's so difficult to know what to think because when I did a program on this, I thought everyone's going to agree with this. And ev the, it, the feedback was entirely, don't you dare bring in porn filters because then the government gets to look at what we watch and then it's the thought police and censorship. And I, I totally take that point. My, my worry was I thought we should have porn filters in Britain because it prevents really young people from getting an addiction and not being able to... Uh, it, it's um, impotence that's a great worry because a lot of youngsters, you know, 17-year-old boys cannot get turned on by a woman uh, because they need this industrial strength pornography. Well, it's totally interesting. And there is a drug effect. So you, you can it can become yeah. an addiction because there's a, is it an endorphin release? Yeah, that, yeah. That yeah. Presumably, yeah, you get rewarded from looking at this stuff. And then when you're with a real woman, you have to imagine that stuff to make it, you know, and that's really weird. And, and the thing that is also interesting is that people on campus and college campuses no longer go out with each other, according to Gail Dines. They, they hook up for sex and then they just don't have relationships, and that makes me think that it's, uh, you know, there is a function, masturbation has a function, I think. It's a, it's a physical test bed for your fantasies, and it makes you work out who you are, and you probably discover whether you're gay or straight by thinking about a thing and testing it out, you know? But if you've got this serving suggestion, then do you ever develop your own sexuality, or do you just take what's put in front of you, which is torture, is fast becoming just torture? And that is a very worrying future where people can't actually fall in love because they haven't learned to on their own because what they've been doing isn't fantasizing anymore. It's actually just looking at this vile thing. But, but what you were saying about, you know, people taking it back, maybe there's a, there's a good uh, reason, maybe there's a need for that now because actually we've forgotten how to love en masse. Maybe people do need to make pornography that, that shows tenderness and... I mean, that's probably the only antidote that's going to work is, is a, a demonstration like Jury and Ryder with his crate of bananas. <laughs> you know, the, this is how it, it is or this is how it used to be. This is what love is like. And th that would be a great thing. I never see it online. I never see that anywhere. Do you, do you not think that any of what you're describing in terms of uh, less long-term relationships coincides at all with women accepting a new kind of power in, in relationships and, and kind of embracing a, a freedom that they maybe didn't feel they had before? Perhaps. And I, I think sometimes I wonder if the pornography is a backlash against feminism because we I don't feel women have found their role properly yet. I think in Britain, anyway, we've found we've taken on the male role. And Jermaine Greer, who is a controversial figure, but I, I do like her. She's outspoken. She said... Yeah, women asked for everything, and bloody hell, they got everything. <laughs> and it's true, because we got, like, the kids, the work, everything, but it's, and it's too much. And what I hope we find is a, a role for us that makes use of our qualities that, we, you know, we're, we're two balanced genders, and men seem very good in the material world, and they, they seem competitive, and they seem to be able to conquer the material world because they're physically superior and I think women are better at nurturing that's why they've been given children and you know this is how we've become and maybe we'll find a role that exploits our nurturing creative side you know we've got stamina we've got tenacity people say we don't have a sense of humor because <laughs> that's been a, a male thing women choose men based on their personality men choose women based on our looks but I think when I hear some of the things women have gone through, you know, in Afghanistan, in places like that, you must have a sense of humor to get through hardship. It's the only way you survive. So yeah, we can. Um, you're making me think of uh, of Jung. And ha have you read any Marie Louise von Franz? No, I must try. <laughs> no. Oh my God, you're you're gonna. She she, she was wonderful. Um, she was a close associate of Jung, and uh, she kind of she made Jung very accessible. 
And there's a quote which I'll try and find and I'll post it in this video. I can't I can't exactly word it right here, but it's the idea that as the as the feminine reasserts itself in our consciousness and as women embrace their feminine power, men also have to embrace their feminine. So I, I agree with you. I think women are figuring out who they are. And at the same time, men are, are getting repositioned they, because the, the old dynamics are not working. And, and it, it's, it'll be a, a balance of all these things in both, both sexes, I think. Yeah, uh, I think that men have to redefine what it is to be a man, uh, which is to be mentally strong. I mean, when you see pornography, it's physically dominating the woman and remind, I think reminding us of our place and saying, listen, love, we are stronger than you physically. We can do this. I mean, it's not conscious, of course, but I think that's the, the desire is to maybe put us back in our place a bit. And... Uh, I, on the other hand, at work, um, it's a positive gynocracy, man. It's just women, you know. And yet, there are all these little clubs of women trying what's to... That, what's that term, gynocracy? <laughs> I think I got it off Family Guy. I don't think it's a real word. But <laughs> I like it. <laughs> but I, I think, like, there are these groups. There's one group called Sound Women, where it's trying to get women back into radio because they've been pushed out of radio. And it's like, no, they haven't. That's crap. <laughs> I mean, hello, Exhibit A. You know, there's loads of us who, who have had no problems professionally. And I don't want affirmative action, you know. I, I think it's a weird thing to say we need help. And then some people think we really do. So I, I'm confused in that sense. But, and maybe I don't, because I'm quite a male thinker. I, I you know, have a male mind, I think, and I don't want kids and all that. So maybe I haven't struggled because I've got loads of male friends and women who are more um, traditional types, you know, then maybe they are having a hard time. So it's really hard to know the progress. You know, the worst thing is the enslavement we do to ourselves. We've just got enough equality. We've got economic power. And what do we spend it on? Magazines that tell us how to enslave ourselves again, because the only way we can contextualize ourselves is whether we got a man and a kid. So it's all about diets, makeup, fashion. What's well, fashion is? You know, <laughs> there's something interesting to me, and maybe you can... Maybe you can slap me down on this because it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's an idea that, that I'm curious about. And that is, you know, I, I, I pretty much accept that we've had this strong patriarchal influence for who knows how many millennia. And, and of course, we could easily list many of the negative aspects of that. Uh, we also have to recognize that where we are now is partly related to that patriarchal dominance. Uh, and I forget what I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> what well, do you think? Maybe there's a downside to a matriarch as well, or no, no. I think I think it's we have to shift back to where it's more balanced. What I was going to ask you is, yeah, how did patriarchal dynamics achieve such an ascendancy when women raise children? Probably because of physical superiority in men being Just the thing that abuse, would be abuse. Abuse. Like, yeah, yeah, probably. And if that happens, if that's a way that people become pregnant, if, if you know, rape used to be a way that, because so, it must have been, you know, in the old days, you could, unless we were more spiritually, more um, intelligent than we are now, then I can see rape wouldn't be desirable because you wouldn't feel, you know, it's not what you'd want. But it's probably been bred into women as well, that, you know, if you survive if it's part of life is if rape is part of life maybe that does become something in the female psyche and a lot of people in the pornography debate argue that it's a fantasy of women's so there there are lots of things if something's happening i think it has a momentum that carries on and if men are physically stronger than women then um they, they're going to be able to oppress them a long time after it's been a criminalized thing to abuse women because we are oppressing ourselves now. We are um, making ourselves servants to men. They're not doing it anymore, I don't think. It's not necessarily men who are saying we want really thin, thin women. I think that's us doing it of each other. We're competing with other women. It's all we know, and it seems to be the momentum of male oppression carrying on. And I really wish women could, because if we don't 
you know, stop focusing on that very self-centered hall of mirrors style, you know, fakery, then we're not going to contribute much. And we have to realize the power we have in terms of personality and uh, what can we contribute that is missing in the patriarchal society. And I think that's happening a bit because when I look online and, and see the businesses emerging, I'm seeing people like Marie Forleo and Oprah Winfrey, dare I say, you know, because yeah, she yeah. gets a lot of flack. But uh, the people who are saying, you know, in business, it's not just about who you can exploit. It's about finding your life purpose. And I think that's coming from a, a feminine side, whether it's men or women say. I mean, someone like Tony Robbins seems in tune with, with a rounded you know, uh, outlook that's both feminine and, and ambitious and, you know, competitive. You know, uh, uh, a kind of ancillary to this, or perhaps maybe you could talk a little bit about this. Um, something that's fascinated me is, you know, you know, the movie King Kong. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There's some deep, uh, psychological, uh, kind of mythological thing going on there. And, um, and, you know, you know, you you hear about a woman who's attracted to a man who's uh, can can express quote masculine qualities. Yeah. Uh, how how do you think that fits into this discussion? Like, is is maybe what we're defining as masculine changing? But but isn't there also perhaps a history of our maybe in our more natural origins of you know kind of I don't know natural selection or you know the woman desiring the strongest male and how is that how is that expressed so that the woman figures that out you know i think it, it must be changing these days when you see people like woody allen the archetypal puny you know <laughs> little guy and um you know people who are rich and i don't think it's about money and i know people think women go for money they go for things like that but I actually think it's charisma and it's it's becoming more that way. But I know several women who who love simply looks and I've never, ever seen the point of that. I just don't. To me, when I see a good looking man, they're going to have to work harder to impress me because I'll think they're full of themselves. So personally, I've always gone for, um, you know, a person's mind and, and how clever they are. But I don't, maybe that's because I'm a male style woman. <laughs> I don't know because... I I don't because I do I marvel at people who just go for looks because what kind of relationship is that I would hope that men are also doing that because whenever a man seems to get rich and famous he will go out with a model and I think people look at that relationship and think lucky him but actually no he's got a really bad deal it's going to be boring <laughs> you know? So I'm not sure how that's going to rebalance, but I think it will be interesting in a world where more and more people are out of shape and unhealthy. Will it if affect evolution, the people who are vegan and fit and look remarkably good compared, you know, regardless of age, regardless of anything else, they just look like the best possible version of themselves. I wonder if that will breed veganism into the genetics. In fact, I'm sure it will because... You're losing friends so young, you know, in their 40s and 50s, it's, it's going to eventually stop people who eat meat from being as successful as healthy vegans. Well, I, this is, I kind of wanted to bring this up earlier. You kind of got close to this, and it's, it would be amazing if the vegan approach was taken on a large scale. A lot of these self-consciousness issues that women and men suffer from will disappear because you won't you'll, you'll kind of, I mean, you could still have cosmetics and maybe fancy dress and that sort of thing, but p people are going to pretty much be svelte. Uh, yeah. Even if they don't exercise, you're, you're going to look fairly decent. So on a, on a vegan yeah. diet. And, and I'm excited about what all that mental energy is going to go to because it's a tremendous amount of mental energy as yeah. a chick. I could decide to have plastic everything. I could have fake nails, fake teeth, fake hair, fake skin, like fake tan, fake eyelashes. And people do that. And it must take so much time. And men are getting it. God, it's terrifying. Oh, if there's, men there's, are a guy, this, there's a guy uh, this, I, I was on some show. He got calf implants. <laughs> 
it's it's too much i i you know what i don't know which way it's going to go because on the one side when you look at something like the internet you get great stuff on the internet that wouldn't have because we had an editorial class who was choosing certain things that's gone now and so you get great stuff that you wouldn't have had access to before but there's so much crap that you sometimes think maybe the majority of humanity are going to die out because they will be choosing stupid partners <laughs> based on looks and it's you know what a what a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, I'm no expert. I I went out with somebody when I was at university who was in his sixties and gay. <laughs> so I really I really hope my mom's not watching this. He said he'd make an <laughs> exception for me. <laughs> so uh, I don't well, know. Well, that's that's interesting. Did was that a was it more like a friendship or was it an intimate relationship? No, it, it, well, I would have liked it to be a. Yeah, but there are reasons it couldn't quite be an intimate thing. But, it, <laughs> you know, I, well, I like what you're to... alluding to. It, it seems to me uh, this whole notion of uh, gay straight is a little bit too polarized. And I think I don't I don't know that it's so much that black and white. I think people are more they're they're more somewhere in between those poles, you know. Yeah, I think there's a delay on this now. I don't know if you can hear me. Okay. Oh, yeah. But, uh, oh, good. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, you know, my favorite writer, Will Self, wrote a book about a gay character and said that he became gay when he was writing it and that he realized everyone is gay. And he thought when it got published, everyone would be like, holy fuck, you know, this is, I've been waiting for this. But actually, everyone was just, uh, whatever, no one battered an eyelid. But I imagine that you see it from the Spartan culture where they, I think, were encouraged to be a bit gay to uh, make the soldiers bond and look out for each other on the battlefield. And in prison, of course, people revert to what you've got to work with what you have in front of you. <laughs> and so, yeah, probably. <laughs> But yeah, I, I've, I could be attracted, I'm sure I could be attracted to women if they had qualities I like, like intelligence. Like, you know, Susan Sontag, that, that she's dead now, but I, I totally, she seemed very fanciable because she's so smart. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I, I, I had my, well, it's somebody, some, a, a relative, uh, uh, a female confessed uh, youthful uh, attraction to another woman, and this is a relative who would never, uh, you know, has kind of a conventional Christian perspective on the world, and the fact that she even confessed that. So I, I just think it's, you know, it's more natural than we might think, you know. Yeah, no, but having said that, I've got an interesting experience with my partner who uh, talks about this all the time, and he'll never watch this, so he doesn't care. <laughs> but... <laughs> He's, he's a cross-dresser, and that has made me realize just how important your upbringing can be because you can have an experience. He got dressed up as a woman when he was a kid and just loved it, and, and he said from that point on it was like this dark secret until he came out with it eventually as an adult. Huh. But uh, it's interesting how your sexual triggers can be defined in your infancy or youth, and uh that that is interesting for me because then he's a woman sometimes like he he is a woman and i struggle with that and i realize it's not because he's a woman because like you know quite fancy men are my favorite but you know you can kind of fancy the odd woman but it's because he's a different person it's that that's a weird thing if he dressed up as a different man it would be weird <laughs> so, yeah, there's a, but it's an education i'm also interested in how malleable people i do think you just it's ultimately whatever's there and, you know, you, well, you can change depending on your environment. That's a fascinating thing. It's, and it kind of brings up, you know, how multidimensional are people and what are the kind of, what are the kind of person we are attracted to? Are they, do they display various personalities or are they kind of more uniform or, you know, well, do you think know. there's a do you think there's a type that will always be more successful in the world, universally more successful amongst people? You mean uh, in successful in what way? Well, do do you think uh, y you know there's a type that it, it's not about intelligence. It's if there's a good-looking man, he's always going to be more successful than a nerdy geek. <laughs> yes, uh, this is, well, it's fascinating what you kind of were talking about earlier in this question, what role does beauty play 
in the world and and you know well be beauty first of all you know you could you could have a huge debate about what exactly that is but yeah i think it's true i think the culture worships whatever the current uh, notion of beauty is and that manifests in reward uh you know financial and otherwise and yeah. even even height you know it's interesting height a tall man is much more likely to be successful <laughs> You know, oh, yeah, they're both that in in business, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and I, I definitely notice. I mean, it's it's bred into. Well, you just know. Like, if I'm going for a job interview, generally I have a quite bland fashion sense. Completely. Sometimes I think it's gone too far because <laughs> don't dress to be offensive. Because I, I that's a backlash against where I was brought up where everything was about looks and you know, my sister had plastic surgery when she was eight years old to have a you know, just ri ridiculous. And uh so I I've gone the other way. But I always know if I ever want to have any influence, I'm gonna dress up and hope that the interviewer just fancies me I'm going to try and do that and it, that I don't know if that but maybe that's just the old dance of you know human interpersonal relationships and this so sometimes I think fashion is a great artistic thing but yeah. it's the periodic introduction of novelty I don't like seasons and that you have this is the season to wear green or whatever I don't that shouldn't be the way it should be just about expressing your individuality so makeup's an interesting thing as well like Ideally, I would just look like one of those collot wearing hippies with a dog on a string, you know. But I don't, I do wear makeup, and I so it's you never know where to stop with the because it is manipulation. But I, I know about you know, in relationships where the man has gone out with me and all his other girlfriends have looked the same, so he's gone for a certain type and he's just thought she's about the right shape, you know, I'd go for her. It's no, it hasn't worked. <laughs> Because uh, you're insecure and there's always someone better looking than you. Whereas if they've gone for you because of your weird personality, you're far less insecure because no one's going to be more like you than you. So I, I think, think that's a great point. That's a great point. And it's, you know, it's the more natural it can be. And also, it seems like there is a, there's a, there's a kind of dating or going with someone who, which is, uh, let's say uh, it, it's uh, it's kind of you're going through the motions or it's, um, you know, you feel like dating someone, so you do. But then there's another kind of relationship that occasionally occurs where there's this energetic dynamic that's inexplicable, right? I mean. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's a, yeah. I mean, I thought for years that <clears throat> that I, if, if I was in a relationship and someone said, oh, I've never felt like this before, I thought, uh what, you got no emotional range, mate? You know, I felt like this. <laughs> and so I thought that, but then, uh, then I was in love properly, really from afar. I never got to be with that person. But it, it, there's a different thing there, isn't there? There's a different feeling of, you know, uh, uplifting your soul. And then yeah. there's the element that I was discussing with someone the other day that um, <clears throat> sometimes... It is unattainable, and actually, what you're going to do? It's. I don't think there's a right answer to that. Maybe you will make do with a relationship that isn't quite as good as that, but it's serving both people really nicely. And then you shouldn't aspire to. Some people would rather be on their own and wait for that to happen again and stuff. So, but I do. I agree with you. I think there's a couple of different levels that there is a, a one that's totally functional and brilliant, and if you have that your whole life, you'd be fulfilled. And then there's this other spiritual thing that's just amazing. It seems to recontextualize everything. And yeah. I never had it till I was, you know, old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Yeah, I, I I was a bit old before that happened, and then I, it finally dawned <laughs> on me what all these love songs were about. You know. Yeah. It's like until then you don't really know what they're talking about, you know, and then well, there's, a, there's a tremendous, you know, lust is a tremendous exciting thing, isn't it? And it and I used to be obsessed with men and you know, I used to get all the thing. But there is another it's a spiritual thing where you think this person knows everything about the world, I, you know, they see everything the same and they uh they articulate it much better and they they're just the other half yeah. Then you, you don't always get to have it, do you? I, and yeah. I also think you shouldn't like mourn the. What happened with yours? Did you get it? <laughs> uh, well, no. What, ha what happened? Uh, 
No, I didn't. Uh, yeah, it was it was a it was a not a good situation. It was uh, oh. well, it, well, it was it was lovely that it happened, you know, because it kind of just came out of the blue. But it wasn't appropriate because the other the the woman was married and had children, so uh, it, it couldn't really uh, develop into anything. But um, but feeling that was pretty powerful, you know, and yeah. it, it made it brought to life what so much artwork talks about, you know? Yeah, the, the profound other thing. Yeah, I think maybe having children does that to people, doesn't it? Huh. I, I, was, I think I'm definitely missing out by not having children, but it's just the sheer drudgery. <laughs> I can't live like that. <laughs> but I, I'm know, so with you, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But you, you know we're missing out on a thing that recontextualizes the world and ultimately it's all just about survival, isn't it? But, you know, it's... I think I think friends are a great thing because uh, they'll be there for you after your relationships have ruined you and <laughs> when kids have left and don't call anymore, the friends who ask nothing of you apart from that you're you are uh, definitely worth having. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But I love like the sentiment you you said earlier. You know, if pain is happening somewhere else, it's it's happening here. And I think uh, it, it interests me that people. Can, they, they feel so much love for something that biologically comes from their own organism, whereas why do we make that distinction, you know? Yeah. It's like now, now, maybe having that experience of a, of a baby coming out of your body, that's something, I don't know what that's like. I'm sure that's a transcendental, phenomenal, emotional thing that is probably hard to define. But nevertheless, why is it? Why is it? You know, I, I'm thinking of like Angelina Jolie, and they have, they have these kids that they – they have biological kids and then they adopt kids and I, I love the, uh, it just seems very open. It's not yeah. restricted, you know? Yeah, my, my mom has said that she totally gets why it's, you and I, anyone gets, there's a drive when you see a, a child in need, there's just this love for it. You want to protect children automatically. So my mom's always said if she adopted a child, it, it's very easy to see them as your own very quickly, you know? But uh, I think people who've had children, because I'm at that age, I'm 32 and lots of people are having children, and they say that it makes them look at everything differently and they start to be nicer and men seem to be a bit more feminine. They seem to be a bit more uh, caring and, and managers seem less annoyed with everything, <laughs> maybe because they start thinking, my, my child is going to grow up and work for someone one day and they start thinking about the the bigger picture that you're suddenly part of a story you're not the story in its entirety yeah that's a great point that's a great point <laughs> all right now I, I i know i have to let you go uh but i wanted to ask you uh that piano behind you and and you oh, mentioned yes. you mentioned music is that is that your primary work uh, how long have you been playing it do you play other well, instruments I, I write music i never i'm autodidactic i never was taught, but uh, I, I found a way of, of writing music and I write lots of stuff and you can find it at soundcloud.com Kerry McCarpet again, like the YouTube thing. Okay. So I've got some things on there and it's actually not that representative, but I've got another website that's crazy. So <laughs> I'm scared to <laughs> tell people about it, but that's got all my music on it, but it is crates mad. It's like loads of because I wrote it all through the uh, wilderness of my 20s, so <laughs> it's a bit mad. I was on night shifts and weird diets. And <laughs> so well, I, I'd love to see I it, can... but I'd love to see it. But if you want to keep it, <laughs> if you want to keep it personal, that's okay. Oh, it's, it's kerrymac.com, Actually, who cares? Like, <laughs> okay. only, only open-minded people go to these kinds of chats anyway, don't they? So they'll, they'll won't mind. Okay. But yeah, yeah. So I don't play that well, I don't think. I did study music at university, but I had to fake my way through it. I had to pretend I could read music when actually I was just listening at the door and playing by ear what I'd heard the last person play. So... <laughs> Well, to me, that's still an accomplishment to be able to play by ear is, is well, amazing. Funny, yeah, people say, people are amazed by that. All through my life, I just thought that was a natural human uh, ability, like reading. But it was interesting to note people think that's more of a thing than being able to read music. So that that's a, a new one on me. That's <laughs> what about right. you? Do you do any music? Well, I, I'm fascinated <laughs> by music. Um, we have a piano over here, which 
I never play, and uh, I have a guitar, which I never play, but uh, we've been reading some biographies. We just, uh, we just finished, uh, uh, well, I've got a biography on Brahms, and I, oh, I read to my mom, read to my mom, I read her these biographies, and um, we've done uh, Goethe, which was fascinating, oh, yeah. and, and then we did uh, several composers, um, did Beethoven and, uh, and Chopin, and um, it's it's fascinating. It's it's. Uh, I, I wish I had the yearning to practice. You know, <laughs> so, then, so, yeah, so do I. I wish I was more practiced. But I but think it's, it's, it's just, part of the human psyche that I've, I've gone into in a video on my channel called something about what what fruit can do for your brain. Look, listen to that, and there's a whole thing on music in that that's, that's right. borrowed from Tony Wright again. You know. <laughs> Well, this thing, this, this, what I love about, you know, when you know when you hear a piece of music and it makes you cry, that, yeah, that, yeah. that kind of power is just amazing. Yeah. And words yeah. are a technology. Words are a man-made thing that's not a universal language like music. But, but again, Will Self, he's definitely, he's the only person I've ever read who manages to capture the awesome beauty of nature because he's got such a way with words. But I've never felt like that about any other, you know, from Shakespeare to, that's all I can think of. That's how widely read. <laughs> but, you know, I've read all the, the people that suggested, but it's rare that you're moved that much by words. He's the only one I've, I've ever had that experience with music, and, and, sometimes art. And his name is Will Self? Yeah. Okay. Right. You, you'll love it. Read I'll, Walk into Hollywood. <laughs> I'll check it out. I'll check it out. All right. All right. Well, care <laughs> Carrie, is there any is there anything else you'd like to say to the viewers? I, we've covered so much. It's it's just a, a pleasure. Yeah, I, I, I suggest you subscribe to this channel because I've been listening to some of these other interviews and they're they're fascinating because they're from people that I see making videos all the time, but then they're not so self indulgent as to talk about their whole thing, you know, the, yeah. their background. And it's great to hear that. I was enjoying the one with Tara from Forty Below Fruity and. Uh, the guy from plant based vegan no plant based athletes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Jay, quite, Jay, yeah. Fascinating, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I love your channel. Well, <laughs> I've said everything else. I've covered the lot. <laughs> you've been you've been thank you for your patience. Thanks for giving me your time. Appreciate it. That's okay. Thank you so much for giving me your time. And right. good luck with I, I really hope this the, the channel gets loads of subscribers and it's doing really well at the moment and it's a great thing to get a cross section of opinions. Thanks, Karen. Take, <laughs> Thank you take, very much. Yeah. I'll talk to you soon, hopefully. Good, good. I'd like that. I'd like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be watching. I'll be watching for the other interviews. All right. All right. And I'm going to start. I'm going to see, see more of your stuff. So it sounds like you got a lot of good stuff there. Well, I, hopefully. I don't know. <laughs> see what you think. <laughs> right. Well, take care. You too. Talk All to right. you soon. Bye. All right, bye.